We know that all of the experiences we have leave some kind of trace in our brains. Everything we do changes the way the brain handles those activities. So what about bilingualism? Bilingualism is something that is the most common activity in the world. When you are speaking language, you are using most of your time every day. Does bilingualism have any impact on the brain? To answer that question, we have to start with a very surprising finding. A lot of research in psycholinguistics, neuropsychology, brain science has confirmed that the way the bilingual mind is organized is perhaps not what you would have expected. If I were to be designing a brain that could handle two languages, I would put in a switch. So now you're using this language, now you're using that language, and they're quite separate. But that's not how the brain is organized. We now know that in the bilingual mind, both languages are always active all the time. Even if you're absolutely sure you're only going to need one of them. Well, that would be very confusing because if both languages are active, you'd expect bilinguals to make lots of mistakes, slipping in a word from the language that isn't appropriate, but they don't. Why not? If the two languages are active, then there's always the possibility of conflict between them. And that conflict is constantly managed by the attention system in the brain. The general system that we use to uh, attend to everything when there's a uh, distractor. When you're in the supermarket, you only want to find the particular kind of yogurt you're looking for. You don't want to be distracted. And your brain and mind has a selection and attention system that does that. And that system is in the front part of the brain. It's part of what's more generally known as the executive function system. It's a really important system. It's the last part of the brain to develop in childhood. And it's the first part of the brain to begin to decline with normal healthy aging. But if we're using that frontal executive system all the time, just to focus on the language we need to be speaking, then that system will inevitably change. It will get stronger. It will get better at doing that kind of selection. So when we look at research across the lifespan, we find that indeed children and adults who have been bilingual all their lives, who have this constant experience all their lives, have better developed structure, in that front part of the brain. And generally, they perform selection tasks better, all kinds of selection tasks, even ones that don't have anything to do with language. So our interpretation is that using those selection processes and brain structures to select the language you need to be speaking because of this rather crazy brain organization has led to certain improvements in those structures. But what about in older age? And here the story is a little more complicated. If we take monolingual and bilingual older adults and match them very carefully, so they're the same age and they perform all of these tasks to the same level, all of the background features that are relevant about them are the same. And these selection tasks are performed equivalently. What happens when we look in their brains? Well, it turns out it depends. On this graph along the bottom x-axis, we have age from 60 to 75. And on the y-axis, gray matter volume where higher values indicate more robust brains. Obviously, everybody wants as big a brain as they can get. So we want gray matter volume to be high. But we also know that with normal healthy aging, we lose gray matter volume. This is normal. This, is, uh, this happens to everybody and it begins 
at around that age, at around 60. So if we look at the red line here, which indicates monolinguals, we see a decline in gray matter volume between 60 and 75 years old. The blue line is bilinguals. And I put in three points from three different studies or sets of studies to show a pattern that's somewhat surprising. At the youngest age, the blue line, the bilingual line is above the red line. At 60 years old on average, in fact, bilinguals have more gray matter volume, better brains. They've experienced less brain atrophy, but that blue line also declines. As I said, there's no escaping that atrophy and it declines more rapidly. So at first it crosses the red line and those are data we have from participants who are about 65 years old and it keeps dropping. So by 75 years old, the blue line is actually lower. So on average in our research at around 75 years old or further into older age, we now have the opposite of the pattern we found in children and young adults. Namely, we have bilingual brains showing less robust volume than monolingual brain. Well, how do we explain that? This graph is a picture of what happens in older adulthood to brain structure. And here you can think of brain volume, gray matter volume, like I just showed you, and in green, cognitive level. So with increasing age, and I've only put in markers for age, these aren't precise ages, but with increasing age, in normal aging, both brain structure and cognitive level decline, but they decline in parallel. They're associated with each other. So as we get older, it's more difficult to do those conflict and selection tasks and our brains are losing volume. But these things are happening in lockstep. So that means you can actually use one to predict the other. If you know what cognitive level someone performs these tasks at, you can basically predict what their brain looks like. And similarly, if you know what their brain looks like, you can predict their cognitive level. But there's a set of circumstances that disrupt that pattern, that disconnects those two curves. And that's the circumstances that we call cognitive reserve. This refers to the effect that all of these experiences that you keep hearing about, more education, active exercise, social engagements, stimulating activity, they help you maintain cognitive level into older age. And the way they do it is by keeping that green cognitive line high, despite what's happening to the brain. And remember, we can't reverse the biological forces that are responsible for brain atrophy, atrophy with healthy aging. But what we can do is keep cognitive level high despite that. So we can put a wedge between them. And what we've suggested in our research is that another such experience that leads to cognitive reserve and separates those curves is bilingualism. This means that any one of these experiences, including bilingualism, should have the effect of keeping cognitive level high even as brain level declines. Let's look at an example. This is a study we did with 100 older adults between the ages of 65 and 80. The mean age was 74. Half were bilingual, half were monolingual. We gave them a lot of background measures to make sure they're all matched on everything we could think of. They had the same levels of education. They did a battery of neuropsychological tests and produced the same scores. Um, none of them had ever experienced memory or cognitive complaints, nor had any of them ever visited a neurological clinic uh, regarding any such complaints. 
They're all perfectly healthy, matched older adults. So we gave them some cognitive and memory tests. And here's an example. This test is called NBAC. The task is to follow a series of slides and press a button each time you see a number. In the first, call, the first row called one back, if the number matches the number you just saw on the previous slide, you press a yes button. And if it doesn't, you press a no button. So for example, when you see that second four, you press yes, it matches the previous slide. The more difficult condition is two back, because now you have to hold all of this in mind and decide if the number you're looking at matches one you saw two slides ago. It's much harder. But in this example, the number two appeared on the previous two slides. Now, the data that I have up on the screen here shows accuracy and reaction time for monolinguals and bilinguals. One back on the left. So look first on the left panel. The one back monolinguals and bilinguals are 90% accurate. It's an easy task. Two back is much harder. So the accuracy drops to about 80%. The reaction time on the right shows that the one back is uh, responded to very fast. The two back, the more difficult task, is much slower. But here there's actually a significant difference. The bilinguals, the open circles, are actually significantly faster than monolinguals in responding, even though their accuracy is the same. But let's just say their performance is equivalent. There's no enormous differences in how these matched groups of monolinguals and bilinguals perform this task. So let's look at their brains. On the top is white matter volume. On the bottom is, red, is gray matter volume. Red bars are monolinguals, blue bars are bilinguals. When the bar goes up, it means greater. When the bar goes down, it means less. And you don't need to read any of the fine print to see that the red bars are going up. Despite being matched on background measures and despite performing equivalently on these complex executive function tasks, the monolinguals have better brain structure in both gray matter and white matter. Now there are a couple of places where despite these overall differences, the bilinguals actually have better volume. And I'll just mention one, and that is in gray matter, two areas responsible for language are actually uh, more robust in the bilinguals, not surprising. But overall, we have this situation that I described earlier for cognitive reserve, equivalent performance on the cognitive task, but the bilinguals have much poorer brain structure. Now, this could be a problem. We match them on everything. Why do the bilinguals have poorer brain structure? Is it possible that this is a standard feature of bilingualism, in which case, it would not be a very positive, attractive idea. The way we thought about this is that everyone in that study was admitted to the study because they reported being cognitively healthy, no brain or memory problems, uh, per perfectly normal functioning, independent living, older adults. So maybe what was happening is that monolinguals who had the kind of brain structure we found for bilinguals were not eligible for our study because they have had cognitive or memory complaints. In other words, the, bio, the robustness of the bilingual brain might have been concealing what otherwise would have emerged as cognitive or memory complaints. Well, to test that idea, we did a study that we called brain swap. It's a kind of armchair theoretical idea, although we really did get data, where we take bilingual brains and put them in monolingual heads and say, so how are you going to manage with this brain monolingual? We did it by matching the bilingual brains from the study I just showed you 
to monolingual brains from a database. So they were exactly the same. So now we have the bilinguals you just saw who are matched on background measures like age and education and everything else that we could find, as well as the exact parameters for their white matter and gray matter volume and structure. What happens? Well, we know that 100% of the bilinguals were cognitively normal because they had to be to participate in our study. What about the monolinguals who were matched on their brains? Well, about 59% of them were cognitively normal, but 41% of them had clinical diagnoses of either mild cognitive impairment or Alzheimer's disease. So these are the same bilingual brains, but now in the head of a monolingual. And now the outcomes are more variable. So our interpretation is that those bilinguals in our study indeed were experiencing more brain atrophy than the monolinguals, but they were able to cope with it. They had more resilience. It did not interfere with cognitive level. Maybe a more dramatic illustration of the same point comes from this. This is a list of some, not even all of the studies that have compared age of diagnosis of dementia, usually Alzheimer's, but not always, between monolinguals and bilinguals. Again, blue bars are bilinguals. And what's plotted here is the age of diagnosis. So what you can see across these many studies that have been conducted in many places in the world, the blue bars are higher. This means that in general, bilinguals are older when symptoms appear and they are diagnosed with dementia. Well, why aren't they showing the symptoms? Are they getting the disease? What's going on here? If the cognitive reserve story is right, then we would expect that these bilinguals who are holding on longer without showing symptoms are nonetheless experiencing the disease but are able to cope with it. We did one study to investigate that idea. In this study, we took monolingual and bilingual Alzheimer's patients who matched on everything, age, chronological age, education, clinical level, cognitive scores. When these monolingual and bilingual patients came into the neurologist's office, they looked identical. But then we looked into their brains. And what this chart shows is brain atrophy. So here, higher bars show more disease, more clinical disease. Left of the blue dotted line is just global atrophy, and the two groups are equivalent. But to the right of the dotted line are measures of atrophy in the areas of the brain around the hippocampus that are taken as symptoms of Alzheimer's disease. And in every one of these contrasts, the bilinguals have significantly more atrophy, which means they have significantly more disease. And so I put that little graphic back in the bottom right corner showing this is what we mean by cognitive reserve. They're performing at the same level, the green bar, but their brain scores, the blue bar, is lower. Well, what can we do about this? Is it too late to go out and become bilingual? We just completed a, a kind of a small test of the idea that maybe just learning a language would be helpful. Learning a language is hard to do. And anything that's hard for your brain is good for your brain. So we took a group of monolingual older adults around 70 years old, and we enrolled them in a training study, we gave them a pretest that included a lot of background tests and specific executive function cognitive tasks. Then they were enrolled in one of three groups, Duolingo to learn Spanish on, on an app, a brain training app called Brain HQ, where they practice brain games every day. And these brain games, I have to say, are very similar to the executive function tests we're measuring them on, or a waiting group where they just were the control. And then after 16 weeks, 
we retested them on all of the cognitive tasks. Now we expected the brain training group to improve because they were just practicing essentially the same kind of tasks that we were giving them in the pretest and post-test. We expected no change in the control group. They were just waiting. But what happens if you spend 16 weeks learning Spanish? I have three tasks that I'm going to show you the results of. The first one is end back again, so you know how that task works. And the graph shows the pre in green and post in orange test scores for the waiting control group, Brain HQ, and the Duolingo group. And you'll see both Brain HQ and Duolingo improved significantly. Second task is called a Simon task. It's a standard conflict task in this literature. And here the relevant variable is how fast you can respond. So again, the control group, no change over time. And both the Brain HQ and the Duolingo group got faster. And finally, a standard Stroop task. You see the word red, but you have to say blue because that's the font color or you see the word green, but you have to say red because that's the phone color. It's very hard to do. And here again, we're looking at speed. So again, no change in the control, but both Brain HQ and Duolingo got faster. So this is a small study, but it's very promising because not only do you have to spend your whole life being bilingual, you might find benefits to your brain and mind even by learning a language in older age, it's never too late. Thank you.